Here's a preview of this episode. The 420 is the hippie man, John Novosad. He starts everything, calms back down. But yeah, I, I'm really happy with this. What I really love is just being on those big stages. It's so much fun. Yeah. Review tape, make changes, rate your jokes, all of that kind of stuff. And, and now, this episode. Hi, I'm Mark Masters. You're whoever you are. Thanks for being here. This is the final episode of Mark Masters Season 1, the web series, the podcast. We're on all the networks. Get out there. Watch all those other episodes. 26 hours plus of content. Me driving comedians to gigs, to open mics all over mostly the state of Colorado, just talking about comedy. The goal was to help Younger comedians, newer comedians get better at stand-up comedy. There's something for everybody in here. If you're a more experienced comedian, you're going to love the last three episodes, including today's episodes, all Comedy Works headliners. Today's episode, releasing on 420, THE 420, is the hippie man John Novosad. He started comedy 40 years ago in 1980. He dropped so much incredible knowledge. I'm so excited about this. Uh, before we jump into the episode and some bonus quarantine content, a uh, conversation I had with John just a couple days ago, but just a couple quick notes. My name is Mark Masters. You can find me online at www.markmasters.co. Okay, send me a note through that website. Join my mailing list. I'd really appreciate it. If you want a uh, Veil Comedy Show sticker, if you want a autographed not copy a not good yet my book uh, I would love to send them to you with a note with some jokes whatever just send me your address uh, we'll we'll figure something out friends uh, let's make that happen it's quarantine time I, I don't have much else going on other than baking you know bake 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 it's pretty much that and write jokes is all I'm doing right now so uh, thank you so much for everybody who uh, has watched and listened, and please tell your friends. Uh, help me increase discovery by subscribing to the YouTube channel, rating and reviewing on all the different podcast platforms, and just sending your favorite episodes to your friends. Hope to see you at a show or a mic sometime soon. Enjoy this episode. Hey, John. Good to see you. Hey, Mark. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, nice I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. We're going to talk more after we watch the episode that we recorded last year uh, that's debuting as the final episode in the Mark Masters podcast web series season one arc. Uh, we drive from Boulder to Comedy Works uh, downtown where you're doing a, a five-minute new talent uh, spot where, that you're hoping to maybe record for late night TV. Um, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on how... Do you remember doing that set by any chance and uh, how, uh, how it went? I remember I remember the set for sure. I don't know if I remember recording that particular one or that particular show, but I'm really happy with that set, and eventually I'm going to submit it once everything comes back down. But, yeah, I, I'm really happy with the set. Cool. And that that's the environmental-themed... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I have the joke about weather door to door and, you know, yeah. what you can do to help the ecology. Yeah, cool. And we talk about that more in the episode. And you give a ton of great advice going all the way back to 1980, uh, wow. working with Roseanne and all kinds of amazing stories. It's, it's really a great episode. So everybody can enjoy that now. And then I'll be back with John after that recorded bit. And we'll talk about the pandemic and comedy and uh, some other topics. And you can find out where you can find him now online and uh, where you'll be able to find live show dates in the future with the hippie man john novasad <laughs> all right hey everybody it's mark masters i'm here with john novasad hey everybody uh we are let's see we're in boulder right now and we're going to comedy works where you're uh performing tonight right yeah i'm doing a five minute set tonight nice. i'll showcase that comedy works downtown mm -hmm. uh let's see 53 minutes 29 miles gotta love driving from boulder to denver yeah, brutal. and I think 53 minutes is optimistic, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> um, cool. Are you, uh, so tonight's New Talent Night, right? Right. Yep, at Comedy Works, Tuesday nights. Do yeah. you, uh, do you often get up? 
I would say town. if I'm in town on Tuesdays, I'll get on twice a month. Nice. And they put five pros on at the end of the show, and it's a really good uh, opportunity to work on a five-minute set. That's what I'm doing at night. Okay. I've got a five-minute showcase set that I feel really strong about, and I just want to try to nail it down, and then... Uh, you know, do something with it. Either send it to a festival, or hopefully send right. it to a so, late night book or something. So like you're that. hoping to get the tape? Or yeah. You will get the tape. I mean, I feel like the set's really close. I may get it tonight, but the one that I want, you know. But uh -huh. I, I'd be surprised if I get it tonight. But maybe. But okay. the set is really close. I did it. I did the same set last Tuesday. Usually I don't get on two Tuesdays in a row, but I did this week this huh. time. Nice. And I did the one last Tuesday, and I mean, I hit every joke that I wanted to hit. It was a good response, but it wasn't like a great response. Okay. You know, so, but I felt really good about the sequence of the set and everything like that. Does it matter how full the room is? Yeah, it does. Although, man, I mean, I've had sold out rooms where you know they weren't, they didn't particularly like me, and I've had mm. really small crowds <laughs> that love me. But yeah, um, it's funny because Janine Garoppolo is going to be at the Comedy Works this weekend, and unfortunately, I'm already booked, uh, so I didn't sign up for any shows. But uh, I worked with her a couple years ago, and I just did 10 minutes on like a Saturday night at the downtown club, and it was sold out. And I mean, I still use that 10 minute set, to, not to try to get on TV, but like for festival submissions and stuff. Because most of the festivals will say, hey, you can send a longer set, but we'll only watch the first five. Right. So I looked at that set right around 5 or 5.05. I got a huge, I mean, it was great. You know? Nice. So, it's in, it does make a difference. I mean, when that, especially at that downtown club, if the room is full, I'm not saying. I mean, I'm I'm not going to say it's hard not to do well, but it's such a good room. Right. Huh. That's awesome. So, are you changing anything from last week? Or are you pretty much doing exactly the same? Pretty much doing the same. I mean, the way this whole set started was, I was going through a whole bunch of old notes. Like I have boxes and boxes of notes, and so. I'm, How long have you been doing comedy? Uh, the first time I ever got on stage was 1980. Holy moly! Yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so I had a That's big incredible. gap. incredible. I, I was full time from like 85 to 93 or 94, but then I, um, I got tired of the kind of road work I was doing, and I was working a job. Part -time. Those are supposed to be like the best times. The 80s. That they was were like the everybody comedy told boom. me. Every, yeah, everybody yeah. says I came up during the boom, which is true, but. I never, I was never good at getting in the clubs, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like it took me a long time to get in the clubs. I don't know if it was probably a combination of me and them, you know, the right. bookers and stuff. But, uh, so I was doing a lot of one-nighters and weekends, which was fine and I learned a lot of it. But man, you do get to a point of diminishing returns with those where like I would drive to Michigan and do like, you know, three weeks in Michigan, Illinois and Ohio and then come back home. But the thing about it is when you were, and it sounds like I'm bitching, but when you were off on off nights, you'd have at least one night, sometimes two, the clubs wouldn't put you up and stuff. So then it's like, well, am I going to sleep in my car? Yeah. And I made a deal with myself. If I'm driving all the way to fucking Michigan, you know, and then back, I'm not going <laughs> to sleep in my car on my off night. So, right. but you do, I mean, I learned so much that way because I stayed true to what, you know, is me. I mean, I work a little dirtier sometimes, I guess, but I wouldn't just totally sell out so that I could kick ass in a sports bar in Kalamazoo, Michigan on a Thursday night, you know? Right. Huh, that's fascinating. So did you start at it, well, do you remember your first time on stage? I do, I, I don't remember the exact date, but I do remember it, yeah. And I want to say it was probably 1980, and there was there was this place in Boulder on, it's, uh, I think it's the Pearl Street Pub now, might be a couple different things, but it was a music room, you know, a concert, little mini rock club uh -huh. that probably seated like three or four hundred, maybe five hundred, and um, called the Blue Note. And there was a guy that was running a talent night there, an open mic, I guess that's what he called it back then. And I had taken a class through, you know, Boulder, where I'm from, Boulder, Colorado has all these alternative schools and everything so there was some kind of weird um, comedy class that I took which I really didn't like huh. and um, I dropped out of the comedy class but the people who taught the comedy class 
gave my name to this guy. So he called me up. Richard Freeze was his name. He called me up and said, um, you know, do you want to do some time? And I go, well, I'm not really coming because that's okay. Just treat it like a workshop. So he kept that thing going for like two years. So the huh. first, my first two years, every Tuesday night, I would go down to the Blue Note. Wow. You know? So that was great. That was really, it was convenient. Were there open mics back then? Hmm. Some music ones and stuff, but nothing like, nothing like okay. there is now. Huh. And I mean, there was, well, there wasn't, I, I started before the comedy world, probably by like three or four years. There was, you know, there were some music venues that would have a comedy night and that kind of stuff. Or sometimes a musician would have a comic open for them. But yeah. Have you opened for any bands? <laughs> Just a couple. And it always <laughs> horrible. <laughs> it's tough. But I did this one. What was the name of it? This thing called Summer Study, I think. And it was a music festival. Okay. And I used to be managed by a guy who managed musicians which was a weird mix and it, it I mean spoiler alert it just didn't really work out too well but he got me some gigs and one of the gigs he got me like I was doing those you know one-nighters in the Midwest like and I was finishing up in Illinois and he got me to do set breaks at this festival called summer study the last day of the festival and I did it on like three different stages and one of them was on the big stage and I think Mo was the headlining act or whatever but man I mean I ate it so hard oh, it's horrible yeah you're outside because the, you're, and well and also they're setting up they're tearing down and setting up behind you mm. people are there for the music right um, you know I'm not going to accuse people of doing drugs but there were some pretty high people I was <laughs> doing this one one set on a smaller stage and this guy kept yelling settle down He's like, don't settle. Or no, he said, settle up. He goes, don't settle down, settle up. And I mean, he said it throughout my whole set. And I was dealing with him and whatever. And the thing that was, the irony of it was like, I don't know if it was ironic, but you know, a week later, this fucking guy emails me. Hey, I'm the settle up guy. I was like, great, nice to hear from Can I go on the road with you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so weird. Uh, but yeah, so that. But I mean, I made good money and it was on my way home. It just um, so do you can you draw any conclusions about differences between the 80s and now or are you in like a different career space well, as a comedian now I mean I think I can now? just generally now if you're a comic uh, and I mean this makes it sound like hey you know I walked uphill both ways to do comedy yeah. but there's so many more opportunities now every scene that I go to huh. now maybe isn't as good as Denver but there's a there's usually an indie scene if it's any kind of size city there's more opportunities for sure mm -hmm. than like in the 80s um but um you know as far as like content or genres of comedy and stuff i don't i mean i really don't see a big difference there, there are less comedy clubs now right than there were then yeah or is that wrong i think there's more now huh. i mean in the 80s well i don't know that's a good question Maybe like in the late 80s or early 90s, there might be less. Okay. But there's still a lot of comedy clubs now out there. Yeah. Do you, so like if you get a gig in Michigan now, uh -huh. you know, are, are you driving out there and hitting towns along the way no, to make man, it my driving just, I don't drive okay. much anymore. I mean, since they can see video, I do have weird eyes. And, <laughs> I just don't, you know, I don't see as well as I used to, so I don't drive. I try to fly okay. when I can. Or, like, I'll go, you know, with another act. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm doing some casino gigs in New Mexico. I don't like to brag, but uh, <laughs> a couple of casinos in New Mexico in April, and I'll work with a, a local guy who can drive and open, you know. Oh, nice. So, but, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, those long road trips, man, I did a lot of them in the car, and I'm just, I'm kind of over that. Yeah. You know? grind yeah um okay so you were talking about sorry i, I oh, got us okay. off topic you were talking about how you have boxes and boxes yeah of old material yeah. Oh, and that's yeah. how that's right and so i just i came up with a system and man i mean i still have so much to go through because it's easy to get sidetracked you know with life and everything but i do have a system to go through these i'm looking at every sheet of paper and then you know highlighting if there's something in there that's worthwhile and i put it in a a folder to go back through transfer that into another binder I mean it sounds very anal lieutenant but but yeah, the thing that's is amazing 
it's what's amazing. Well, what's really good about it for me is then I have I have an index of the bits that I've reworked. So then when I'm going through this notebook again and I see that bit, I can check the index. And if it's there, then I just either recycle it or archive it. Uh, but I found this joke that I used to do. It was in the 90s, I guess. And I don't even remember how I set it up in the 90s. But I was like, you know, I have time to kill, so I like to do the weather door to door. Yeah, and I've heard you do that. Yeah, and that, that joke, and then the, the way that joke used to be was, um, when you like to see me coming up to your door, uh, and I'm like, hey, I'm looking for Jesus, have you seen him? Because I was looking at my weird eye and I might have missed him or something, which got a laugh, you know? <laughs> but so I was doing that joke, but I just remember something that a couple of bookers of te from television told me, and also, yeah, just that said, you know, you got to be really careful with religion. Like, I had a joke about had Lutherans, and this guy was like, we wouldn't use the Lutheran part of it. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, man, I want to try to make this set so I could submit it to TV if I can get someone to look at it. Right. So I just took that part out about the weird eye and Jesus, you know. Right. And I just started doing it. It was strong enough that it would work all right. And then one night I just said, hey, wouldn't you like to see me coming up to your door? And then I did like the, the person at the door going, man, if this guy's selling cookies, I'm definitely buying. <laughs> and that line has turned into a really big line. And now I'll even go like, looking through the people going when you like see that guy and it's turned into like a really strong joke but the other thing is about that is that when I did that weather door to door joke I was like man I want to try to put together a five minute set that and granted loosely based on the environment you know mm -hmm. so then I started going through my notes and I found another joke that I used to do a long time ago about um, I watched the weather channel and drink and after a while you forget what you're watching and then that colored radar comes on and you're like, I love that joke. Yeah, there's a green block attack in Idaho. And then I so came up funny. with the tag about, on a side note, that joke kicks ass in Boise, which works yeah. almost everywhere. So then I had that. I have a joke about recycling, you know, with plastinium, which is like melting down all the things into one compound. Oh, and I found in those notes too. So that, the plastinium thing is an old joke? or No, that's okay. a newer joke. Okay. And so this, this set, this, the environmental set, is sort of a hybrid. Because uh -huh. what it made me do was go through my notebook and see what things I could loosely categorize as environmental uh -huh. or eco-friendly. So when you write today, do you still write on paper? Yeah, I do pretty much. I'll dictate it in my phone a little bit, and I want to do more of that. But I still write on paper. I'm really a notebook guy. Do, do you have like a schedule or is it just no. whatever? No, and I mean there's sometimes when I'm like super productive and other times, you know, where I'm not. But the one thing that I'm always doing is, uh, and, and I write in this sense, I, I'm doing like, you know, five, six, seven shows a week. And that's, that's, a, that's a big difference between like, you know, the local scenes say like in the 80s and 90s with now I mean even if you weren't me I mean I'm so grandfathered in to this scene I can get on you know a ton of shows and I, I still hit mics and stuff but you know I'll get on like five or six nights a week when I'm home and then go on the road and do a weekend where you do another five or six shows and one thing I'm really good about is like since I take the bus and stuff I'll have my notebook with me I'll go down early either to the South Club or downtown get a beer, coffee, you know, and sit, and sometimes I'll just write, I don't even write material, I write down what it is I'm trying to do physically on stage, mm -hmm. think about the way that I move, uh, I'm really sloppy with the mic, it's my worst habit, and I have a soft voice, and so I remind myself, you know, to stay on that mic, that mic yeah, job. it's, Eat it. it's, man, I mean, I'm, that is my worst habit for sure, hmm. I had a really big booker who saw me do a showcase and said, man, it's not the material, but I couldn't hear you. That was a fucking hard uh, note brutal. to get, you know? But he did say, you know, it's an easy fix, and it is. So, right. But, you know, stuff like that, so I'll write myself. And I, I also will, although you can do this to where it's really not effective, but I have a three by five index card in my back pocket, and I'll write. Usually it's something technical, you know, like, stay on the mic um, yeah work on act a goal outs. for that yeah for that. and uh, it's, okay. you know you can literally look at it yeah right before um i've had something like that with material too either or but like a, you know standing backstage before a really important set and you just look at that index card you 
you know, 30 seconds before the guy brings you out on the stage and then put it in your back pocket. Uh, if you have too much on there, it's overwhelming. Like, I, right. I try to keep it in, like, four things or less, because otherwise it's too much. But yeah. What, do you have one for tonight, or are you going to make one when I you get there? Or? I don't. I don't have anything in my back yeah. pocket tonight, so. <laughs> but part, <laughs> but I, I have some stuff in my pack. Okay. Uh, I think I have some cards in there. Did you, did you do one last Tuesday? Did you yeah, have, uh, Do you I remember did. what your goals and were? I, yeah, I just had, I had, like, the first four jokes, the first three jokes, that set because I wanted to do it in a specific order and then there's another Denver comic who um, that you know was a legend in Denver uh, Rick Kearns man and I was get, I wasn't for this set but I was getting ready for a really big audition set or something and I told him like, man I'm really nervous about remembering the order because I did want to do it in a certain order and he goes think of it as dominoes he goes once that first one falls it hits the next and so, and, and that really helped me as far as like remembering the sequence that I wanted to do for this set. So I just looked right before I went up at the first three jokes, you know, it's like um, weather door to door, the weather channel, and I believe in global warming, or I think there's positives of global warming. Okay. I'm in favor of acid rain. Is the yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of my favorite things that you do, which is, it cracks me up every time you have this like magical tag where you'll tell a joke, you get a big laugh, and then you laugh at the joke. Mm -hmm. You just do this like silly, like very warm laugh at yourself, and people will laugh just at you laughing at the joke. I love it. It's, it's yeah, it's incredible. really weird, and I thought I thought long and hard about that, you know, because I mean it's almost like counterintuitive because I am sort of laughing at my own. You know what I mean? Like they say, don't laugh at your own. It material. works for you. People really like it. And, it and makes it, you very likable. It does. Too. I do have a high likability factor. And the other thing that really made me decide to do it was that it's genuine. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm not. If I laugh here, it just I'm having fun. Yeah. And it shows, you know. So yeah, but thanks. And I do, man. I have a really high likability <laughs> factor. Do you, and so, are you still like you appear to be having? genuine fun on stage are mm -hmm. you still you still enjoy this and I do I mean the I was just saying this to somebody the other day the reason that I'll come down to Denver for five you know five or six I mean I, in, in the last month I've had two weeks where I did in town you know in Boulder Denver where I did ten shows twice you know in a month uh, you know over the course of a week and the reason that I'll go down there because I mean I can make a little money in Denver but a lot of those shows I mean, I've always said, if I was doing this for the money, I would have quit after five years, you know? But that's the thing that drives me on the shows. So, I, yeah, I'm still having fun. And also then, I mean, like I did, um, I opened the Comedy Works, I'll name drop. Uh, got it, now I can't think of his name. That's uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, No, for Pete Holmes. They, oh, Just that's awesome. Thursday, yeah. Amazing. Thursday, Comedy Works South. And he sold out, you know, at 450 seats. And he asked the club to not drop the checks during his set. So I'm posting. Mm -hmm. So then the club said to me, can you do five minutes? Like know, towards the end? After after he's off. Oh, you know, when I go up to say goodnight, yeah. just do some time. And I'm, I jokingly said to the manager, you know, that's the toughest time to do. But I did. And I said, hey, best case, if I can, you know, hold my own, what? you want me to do like eight minutes and they're like yeah if you could and I did I did eight minutes ten minutes and it wasn't great I mean Pete Holmes slayed it yeah you know, of he course. sold it out 450 but it was great he gave me a nice compliment in the green room he's like dude that was really good man. Huh. he goes you know and I mean but the point of it is and I said this to him I was standing there he's kicking ass the room's going crazy and and I just said to myself let's see how good these jokes are you yeah know? that's yeah that's, that's what drives me right yeah there. And so to come down on a Tuesday night to go, or, you know, to... Did you do material up front as well? Oh, yeah. Okay. I did 10 minutes. And, and so I had I had a good 40 minutes. You know, they the, the manager came up and talked to me after he was on stage. So I sat down in the green room and thought, well, what jokes did I oh, do? Oh, you didn't know ahead of time? No, because oh. he, I mean, he's... He so you've already to, ostensibly burned your best material. Well, I knew... Yeah, I didn't know I was going to do extra time for sure until after I came on. Okay. But I just sat down and, you know, wrote out what jokes that I did. I remember what jokes I did in the opening. Mm -hmm. And then I, I wrote, 
you know, a weird little list. And I'm not gonna lie, it was it was choppy, you know. <laughs> but, haphazard. <laughs> but it worked, you know, and you do I always say it's like golf. If you gotta it, you know, it's like golf. Sometimes you're hitting out of the rough and right. sometimes you're right down the middle of the fairway, you know. Huh. But I mean it was great because I got to meet Pete Holmes. I yeah. Open for in front of four hundred and fifty people. So cool. Yeah. You know, that South Pub, man, when it's full, it is really fun. I mean, it's fun anytime, but that's what drives me, you know, because I'll come down here. I still really love doing the shows. I still am having It must fun. take you a long time to get to the South Pub. How long does it take? It takes an hour and a half if you get everything. Because yeah. I take a bus. To, to the light rail. Yeah, to the station. And then, and then, yeah. It's like a 15-minute walk. It's not bad. Yeah. But, it's a bit um, of a hike. And does everything run on the way back? Um, it does, days. but then that's where it takes longer because it doesn't run as, as frequently. frequently. So sometimes I'll get to Union Station and I'll have to kill 45 minutes. Yeah. I, was just, I was just in Atlanta and I was so frustrated because I plug in the, the public transportation directions into Google. And it's like, all right, your bus arrives, which is like a 10 minute walk away, yeah. in six minutes and at 6.05 a.m. Wow. And it was like midnight, you know. Yeah. Like I was like, "Oh man, I missed." I I'm take missing that the time. last bus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know. Well, there's times, especially on the second shows, when I get home, because where the bus, the Boulder bus station is like a 40 minute walk from where I live, so I'll have to take a lift either that. Or, I mean, I'll sometimes make that 40 minute walk, but at one o'clock in the morning after two shows, you know, like, yeah. I kind of feel like walking. Maybe the weather is nice. Yeah. Uh, but. I, I've gotten used to it, and I I do need to make better time, better use of my time. I don't want to become fanatical, but I just screw around on my phone, or, you know. Yeah. I've been reading books on stand-up. I've read a couple, and I'm on a third one, but this third one is just, uh, I feel like I'm piling a field. I can't, yeah, I can't quite get going on it. What, have it, the other two books, did one of them you particularly enjoy? Uh, do you remember them? God. Um, I can ask you later, and if you remember, yeah, I'll put it in the notes. Sure, I'll take a look. Okay. I might be able to, well, I'll, I'll yeah, look, because I think I have an email. i got to check them out at the library. Cool. One of them is by this guy, the one that I'm having a hard time with, and that one's called Comedy Writing Self-Taught. It's by this guy named Gene Perret, or P-E-R-E-T, I think. And he's an old school guy. Like, he wrote for Bob Hope. Huh. And Phyllis Diller and stuff, and he has one called the other one that he had that I really liked. Uh, it's, it's a comedy. I'm checking. Book. I haven't read anything. Yeah, yet, so I'm checking out. But he had some good exercises. Uh, I wish you remember the name. I'll have to look at the uh, at my notes. Okay. But the the one that I read had such a good note about hosting, and it's stuff you know that I've already already know. Sometimes I mean. I'll, I'll be surprised but this was just such a good note and it was it just reminded me and it was like when you're a host you know um, be positive about everything you want everybody to look good don't go up after the act and, you know I mean there's some guys that are really good at that and can do it in kind of a playful way and stuff but I just think it's a good note you know it's like you're the host everybody you want to make everybody look good you want everybody to have fun and sometimes you forget that stuff because I'm just like oh god I hope I don't screw up this guy's name you know right and it was just, it was a really very. Good I, I don't have much hosting experience, but the couple of times I've done it so far, it's been surprisingly stressful. Yeah. You know, it's already stressful for me as a newer comedian to get up on stage right. in the first place. But then you gotta, like, you know, at these indie shows, you know, you're timing people, you're running the light, you're, you're bringing you gotta up a remember lot of their name. Too, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing for me. And I mean, like, Pete brought his own feature, so I had to learn her name. She was super funny. Lara Bites. She just did um, a David Spade show, Lights Out. She was the first comic to do stand up on his show. Huh. And she was featuring for Pete. So, you know, there's that. I'm always afraid I'm going to screw up someone's name, which isn't the end of the world, but still it's stressful. Yeah. You know, and then you have to keep your eye on the showroom, even though you know somebody's going to be on there. I mean, I have to keep in the showroom, but. Right. Like if someone's on for 30 minutes, I'm going to pop in and out of there some just to make sure, you know, everything's cool. Did, did Pete sell a lot of merch? Did you happen to notice? He did not have any merch. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, not for this one. I'm sure he does sometimes, but yeah, he didn't have merch. And then he was going to the downtown club 
he was there. He was south Thursday and then did downtown Friday and Saturday, four shows. So it goes out. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I mean, yeah, I mean he's a huge name. I listen yeah. to his podcast all the time. Yeah, I just finished his. Really I just read his book like two um, weeks ago. Yeah, and man, I mean he was super funny too. It was. It wasn't just that people were there to see him. I mean, right. He crushed. That have you seen his TV show? I Crashing. haven't because I don't have HBO. Okay. But. Uh, you get the DVDs at the library. Oh, can you? Yeah, have to check yeah. It out. that's how I watched the first season, uh-huh. and then I borrowed somebody's HBO account right. to watch the next two. No, I, I would like to see. I really it. enjoyed it. And I'd love to ask you, like, right. if you think that's authentic, because it's you know it's a while, it's a couple decades ago. Right. It's New York City, which you know isn't Denver, Boulder, but right. I'm sure you've been out there. Well, and I mean, I one of the things, and there's still some of that, is the condo thing. That was crazy, man. And yeah. I mean, there's still some of that. More more clubs are using hotels now. But I've shared condos with a lot of different comics. And it's surprising. I mean, I could probably count on one hand the people where I was like, this guy was an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but what's weird about it is, and I think I heard Chris Rock say it. He goes, you're staying in an apartment that two or three different comics have been in the week before and it's like that week after week after week so after a while man these places get <laughs> it's pretty, pretty gross yeah and you're just like <laughs> man you know and then it's like well I'm not making enough to really get a hotel so you right. just do what you gotta do there's only been a couple times where I was like I can't I can't stay here it's so bad yeah, yeah. did you uh, were you in the Denver scene when Roseanne was coming up yeah, yeah. I, you know I have I haven't seen Roseanne since then but I did a ton of shows with Roseanne yeah. in the 80s like in Pueblo Steamboat Springs and we both it, before Comedy Works there was this place called Basin's Up which was like kind of across the street it was upstairs and it was a jazz kind of club I guess or a music club and they were doing comedy there across the street across Larimer I guess it's, or man my sense of direction is really sad but I'll ask when we get there maybe you can point yeah I guess it would be does 15th go into Spear, right? Uh, no. Larimer, Larimer does. So it's Larimer. Larimer's the one that's always, like, blocked off with the yeah, lights. It's, yeah, that's, and that's where they have the dinners and stuff that they yeah. block. Yeah, so it's Larimer. Okay. I mean, I've only been going to that club for a million years, but I just don't, I don't sure. know. I have a weird thing about direction. But yeah, it's on the other side, and it was upstairs. Huh. Interesting. And so uh, I did shows with her there, I'm sure, and then the comedy works. But... Um, yeah, and she, I mean, she was great, you know, she was super nice. In fact, I'm divorced now, but when I got married, I think that uh, Roseanne and her husband, Bill, they were some of the first people that Len and my ex and I told her we were getting engaged, you know, because huh. I think we just happened to be on a gig with them. But yeah, I did a bunch of shows with her. Huh. How about uh, Joey Diaz? Do you know who that is? And I know who Joey Diaz okay. is. And it's he really, was in Boulder, right, at some point? At some point, but this is what's really weird, is that I never... Back then, I didn't know him because I think that was like I had a break from about '93 to 2001, where I really wasn't doing all that many shows. I was still doing some road work. I got I got divorced in '96. I came off the road in '93. That's when we really started having problems. I guess. Uh, but no, I mean I was gone for like 35 weekends a year and stuff for years, oh, you know. And then I came back home. And I don't know, but. I, I was working a part-time job. I just do temp work because I had health insurance through Lynn, okay. uh, my wife. And then this company offered me a full-time job, but I was like, no, I don't want to work full-time because I was still doing some road work. So I just I traded off benefits to have flexibility. But because of that, I wasn't really going to the local scene. Uh, and I think right. that I had like about a six or seven year period where I really didn't do very many local shows. And I think that's when Joey Diaz was in the scene and then I met him through the comedy works and so he used to be a doorman at Wits End which was a comedy club that God it was open for a long time it was in Westminster like 88th and Harlan okay. and so he said he was a doorman there and it's just I never crossed paths with him until I met him at the comedy works and he's playing the Paramount Theater yeah he's it's amazing doing big it's like a 1600 seat theater yeah that's incredible yeah. have you done any theater stuff I've done some. I've opened for Josh Blue. Uh, Josh is a good friend of mine. And after uh, he won Last Comic Standing, I did some theaters with him. I, I did the Paramount. I opened for Neat. him. Yeah, That's cool. Is that different? Yeah, it is. You can't, I mean, can you see the audience at all? 
I think you can. Yeah, well, I can't. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's hard to see. You can see a few rows, but it's pretty bright. But that's the way it is in comedy clips, too. I can just yeah. see a couple of rows. I like that, actually. Right. Um, the thing about the theater gigs, I mean, I guess you kind of have to give it a little extra beat. But what I really love, you know, for the laugh and everything, but what I really love is just being on those big stages. It's so much fun. Yeah. Do you move around a lot? I don't. I move around more. I used to be almost static on stage. I, I move around way more than I used to. And if I'm on a big stage like that, I'll try to move around a little bit more. Uh, and then I've done Red Rocks because of Oh, on no the way. Rocks. Yeah. Oh, they have this thing called Film on yeah. the Rocks. And I have a comic open for the movie. That's incredible. I've done it like four or five times. The first time I ever did it, man, it had to be. It was over 10 years ago for sure. But it was, the movie was um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So it was sold out. And I think it really does make a difference if, if it's a comedy. Like I did Top Gun one year, and that was all right. But. Right. It's a comedy, man. And I just remember... That's a good comedy for you, yeah. your persona. And I had that moment on Red Rock, on the stage of Red Rocks, where I'm like, I have these people laughing. These people are... You know what I mean? Because sometimes it's You got them. Yeah, there's sometimes that's that it's cool. that big, where you just feel like you're shouting into a void, you know? Right. But yeah, that was really cool. And I've done the Boulder Theater a couple of times. There's some shows. Nothing too big. Well, I opened Remo Phillips back in the day at the Boulder Theater. Oh really? Yeah. Huh. That was really fun. Neat. So what? Um, when you got back into comedy, mm -hmm. uh, just basically you're saying you started doing a lot more local stuff. Like why did you do that? And well, I just I after I went through the divorce, um, I really stopped pretty much. I would do maybe I don't even think I was doing one show a week, and I had a period of like four or five years. But what happened was, I worked for this company and I got laid off. At that point, I had morphed into full time. I had benefits and everything. Um, and it was a production facility, and they moved it to Tijuana. So, so I, I became a product of NAFTA. Okay. But what this company did that was so cool, all those years that I worked part time, they treated it as far as full time. Oh, uh, for your for severance. severance. Amazing. And they just gave me this sweet severance pack. So. Uh, like this one friend of mine who is in a comic said, it was like I got a corporate grant to get back into comedy because I got a paycheck <laughs> every two weeks for like, I don't know, four months or something crazy like that. That's awesome. Maybe even longer. And so that's when I started doing... Resurrected, back from the dead. Yeah, yeah. And that's when I started doing more local shows. I actually went down to the Comedy Works and I was on the list way, from way back, but I hadn't been there so long they took me off the list. Oh. So I emailed Wendy and I was like, man, I hope you don't think it's presumptuous, but I signed up, I wrote my name on the list and signed up and she couldn't have been nice. She was like, you know what, John, I'll start you off. Cause I, I mean, I've known, known her for a long time. Right. She goes, I'll start you off with some five minute sets and then, and that's it. And I just worked my way back up. And I wish I still had this recording cause it was back in the day when they had the answering machines, you know? But she called me and left a message for me and said this was like two or three years after I'd come back. Uh -huh. I was just doing every local show I could. And she goes, hey, I want to check your availabilities for headlining, you know, oh, like man, a Thursday. That's so yeah. cool. And that's when I was like, damn, yeah, you know. So, and then I just started, I started getting back out on the road, but I was really a little more particular in the kind of work I tried to do. Now, was up. anybody around, like phone numbers you had and I don't know if there was email? <laughs> back then but like the yeah. club managers and stuff or it was pretty much 100 percent turnover pretty much maybe like 90 or 95 percent turnover okay. but what you know was around were comics that i work with back then that you know i contacted and said hey i'm back you know and i mean i didn't contact them right away but once i really felt like i had a good good enough feature set to go out on the road i would reach out to some friends that i worked with in the past so then they would, you know, run a little interference for me with the club or help me set up a showcase and stuff like that. Right. Huh. So what do you think helped you the most back then to kind of get your chops back or get comfortable to, on to stage? To get back? Yeah. Um, um, a big part of it for sure is repetition. And, and I still say this when comics ask me for advice, man, taping. I, I won't listen to everything. God, that, I mean, I would end up on a tower with a rifle. But to, 
But to take, that's what, when I first started coming back, I mean, that that was, you know, really valuable to me because I wouldn't listen to it necessarily right afterwards, but go out, get a cup of coffee, look at my set list and listen to my set and then write notes, and, you know, and I still do that. Like I say, I, I don't do that all the time, but what I will do is I'll write a note in my notebook and say, um, you know, listen to the October 7th set at the Comedy Works find the sequence about the shoes on the bus and listen to that because they either had a good head lib mm. or like, you know, and so to single that out and if you make that notation and then go back, that's how I ended up getting, or still do, get so many tags and callbacks from ad libs. That's how I got that, hey, if this guy's selling cookies, I'm yeah. definitely buying it. And I, uh. I wrote a note in my book and then went back and listened nice. to it. And so that cookie thing, did you come up with that on stage or was yeah. that like an idea on the bus or... Yeah, you know what it was is it's like it took probably took a month or two of me eliminating that the Jesus part of it. But then I would just say, "Hey, when you like to see me coming up to your door," and that would get enough of a laugh that if I didn't think of something else, I would just move on to the next joke. And one night, I didn't do the peephole part. I added that, but I just said, "Hey, when you like to see me coming up to your door," and it just popped in my head, going, "If this guy's selling cookies, I'm buying." Hmm. And then that got a big laugh, and it was like, "All right, now." You know, I felt really good about that because the first joke is the weather door to door, you know, and that gets a pretty good laugh. And then that the cookie thing is, a, you know, if I do say so myself, a hell of a tag. So it's it's nice to have that. I mean, I front load my act, you know. I, right. I want to try to get laughs as fast as I can. The only time I'll ever go, hey, let's hear it for, you know, so and so is if I'm first after the MC, I'll always get a round of applause for the MC. If I'm last, if I'm headlining, I'll let's hear it for everybody you've seen. But all that stuff in between, I'm there, man. You're just doing yeah, material. Yeah, I'm trying to get yeah. as fast as I can. Unless it's like, you know, a real shit show going on out in the showroom, I'll, I'll tread water for a while or something to try right. to, you know, do, to come back. But. How do you handle showcases where there's not a lot of people in the audience? Do you? Do your act differently, or do you just kind of plow through? I mean, do you have any specific stories or examples? Of, like, I, that kind I of actually situation? do have um, a story. I'll tell you, my general rule is on a small show. I mean, there's a couple things I don't do. I never acknowledge that it's a small show. Like one of the things Mike's wife said to me, which was just one of the best pieces of advice I ever got in show business, and she didn't have a damn thing to do with show business you know but I was on the road in Illinois and I was doing these one nighters man and it was just brutal I was it was a two person show and I was first and I don't remember who that one was but I would go up and these small crowds they wouldn't laugh and stuff and so I was commiserating and bitching to her about it and she goes hey man don't do the you know don't do the show for the empty seats do the show for the people that were there and that really did make a difference so I really try to keep my energy up and stuff like that and I, I might do it a little bit differently, but I pretty much just what I'm going to do. Uh, I will kind of psych myself up and remind myself to keep my energy up. You know, I'm not going to be like, wow, but just, uh, you know, don't, I always hate that. I definitely have gotten to, you know, with big crowds or small crowds, a point of no return where you're just like, this is not going to get any better. And that's, that does feel like when, you know, you're just going to plow through. I've said to audiences before. I'm gonna plow this field for 45 minutes, you guys. So I hope you come along with me. But that's like one in a thousand, you know. Yeah. But this this uh, actually took place at that Wits End Club, which was in it's in Westminster, like a northern suburb of Denver. And um, I was co-headlining with this guy named Vince Valenzuela. And so when you co-headline, you know, you flip. One time you're in the middle. One time you're closing. And it was weird because it was just like if whoever was in the middle had a great set. You know, the other guy, the closer wouldn't, huh. or vice versa. If the headliner had a really good set, then the middle wouldn't. So it's the last night, it's a Sunday night. Vince goes on in the middle and just kills. And I mean, it wasn't a huge crowd, but there was like, I don't know, 50 people there. So I go on, and I mean, there, I'm not getting any laughs at all. I'm just struggling. And it's like eight, 10 minutes, 12 minutes in, no laughs. And I hear a train going by, I hear a train whistle. <laughs> So I acknowledge it to the crowd, and I go, man, you know the comic's having a hard time. 
when the old 815 goes by and you can hear it, you know, and they laugh a little bit. And I just started ad living train jokes, and I go, yeah, a lot of comics work cruise ships, I work Amtrak, you know. And, and man, I won them over, and I uh, went back in, I eventually got back in the material, and I mean, it wasn't the best set I ever had, but I went from literally nothing to, yeah. you know. And so I, what do you think the lesson is there? Don't give up. You know, you gotta keep fouling off pitches to use a sports metaphor. You know, because the worst thing you can do is just—I mean, the worst thing you can do is get mad. But if you just are gonna be like, I'm gonna fall down, you just have to keep doing it. I, I mean, it's hard. You know, and I'll acknowledge with the crowd. Like just the other night, I was doing this corporate thing, and they were not easy, man. And um, they liked—I'd have a bunch of weird eye jokes, but they were real selective, and they would laugh at those jokes, and I go back into material. And they wouldn't laugh, so I did another weird eye joke, and they didn't laugh at that. So I acknowledged, and I go, "Well, there's a weird eye joke you guys didn't laugh laugh at, and that got a laugh." But that set never got. I never got to that thing like I did with Matan. But I'll tell you, I, I I always equated to like some shows. It's like you go into a gym and you hit a heavy bag for 30 or 45 minutes, however it is, you know, and you walk out and you're like, "Damn, man, that was hard, but I did it." Yeah, there's a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, and so, I mean, I just, yeah, just keep throwing hard. Have you ever been stiffed? Yeah. Like not, yeah? You I got any good stories about that? I have a story about, this was God. It had to be 1992. There used to be these clubs in Oklahoma called the Jokers. Now they're called the Looney Bin. It's a different... Um, like same real estate, but different company? yeah. But um, this guy saw me at Joker's who worked there. And then he contacted me. And he goes, hey, I want to do, he called it a comedy festival. And this was way before comedy festivals. I would say it was like 1992 or something. And he goes, I want to do this comedy festival in Vail um, over Labor Day weekend. I'm going to headline Steve Agrew, who's another local comic. And he wanted me to feature. He's going to pay me 500 bucks, put me up in a hotel in Vail. So I say to Lynn, I go, man, this will be fun, let's do this, you know. She's like, sure, we'll do it, that'll be great. Then he calls me up and he goes, what would you charge to do a second show? So I'm like, you know, I'm just like, well, I'll put the chips on the table, another 500 bucks. He, he goes, yeah, I go, this is great, you know, two nights, maybe a dozen. Wow, yeah, so, plus lodging. Yeah, plus lodging, it's all, you know, we'd have to buy food. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to fly anywhere, it's yeah, a couple hours away. Yeah, so we go up there. And this is when I knew, I didn't know I was going to get stiff, but this is when I knew this guy didn't know what the hell he was doing. And this was, you know, before the internet, I guess, or, yeah, it was before the internet. But I go, I meet him in the showroom, Lynn and I, you know, we check in. Do you remember where it was in Vail? Oh, God, I don't. Okay. I don't. There used to be a music club in Vail, in uh, Lion's Head. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore. This was like in a big hotel conference room. Okay. Of. All right. So I go in there, and the guy's name was Michael. How are ticket sales? And he goes, oh, I don't know, man. I don't want to freak myself out. And I'm like, you don't know how ticket sales are? And I mean, there's like 200 seats in this room. And we're gonna do, we were going to do two shows in one night. We're doing, you know, one show a night. Okay. And I was like, all right, you know. So we get back. We go back to the hotel. And I tell him, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Goes, the promoter doesn't know how many tickets he sold. Right. So we get there. How do you even sell tickets back then? Was there a ticket master? Yeah, or I don't like know. That? I don't think, he, I think he probably did it through like, you know, like the front desk at the hotel yeah, or something. Yeah, and maybe, you know, had a poster with like tickets available at these Call locations. Call this phone number. So, sure enough, man, we get there. This I don't know, let's say 150 seats, but it was a lot and 39 people, that's it. So we get to the show and then we can't find Michael. Oh, jeez. His girlfriend goes. He's you got drunk. checked into the hotel though. Oh, we got the checked lodging in. worked. Yeah, the okay. lodging worked, and then we finally found him. He was drunk, and we're like, dude, what? I give everybody involved in that a lot of credit because it would. I would never get somebody over that shit, but I've I've seen guys that would have been like, fuck you, you drunk bastard. Sorry for cussing. <laughs> That's okay. But, but you know what I mean, like, and everybody was cool with him. We met him the next day. He was gonna go down to Denver, talk to some money guy or whatever. So we decide to stay up there and do the show. The second yeah. show? Yeah. Okay. And, again, and then everybody did all the comics, the headliner? And yeah, McGrew and me, and I don't, I don't remember who. Okay. 
So we we all stay. I mean, we had our own separate little pile. We're like, well, we're here, and we just made damn sure that the rooms were paid for. You know what I mean? Because it's like one right, thing if yeah. you get screwed, I'm not gonna pay for my own damn room too. Yeah. So the rooms were all taken care of, all that stuff. So we stay up. The long story short, or short story long, whatever. I ended up getting 395 of the thousand, and then. I was gonna take him to small. I was pissed. I'm like, I'm taking this guy to small claims court. So I do this research, and I went ahead to take him to small claims court in Tulsa because that's where uh, he resides. But I had a gig at that club, so I called the owner of the club, and he was like, he was like, don't do it because he doesn't have a job. He goes, you'll win the case, but the guy doesn't have a job, so they can't garnish any wages. He goes, it's just gonna be you're putting, you know, good money after bad or whatever. Right. So I just wrote oh, it that off. sucks. But yeah, but the, I very few times have I really got. I mean, hurt. that's not as bad as it could have been. You yeah. got some money. Uh, yeah. And you got a mini vacation. And and realistically, I mean, I don't know. It was probably what I should have been getting paid. Should have been closer. Right. Five hundred bucks anyway. I mean, yeah. once the guy asked me again, I'm like, well, let's see if he'll save five hundred again. Sure. So yeah, it could have been way worse. So how does the, uh, so you've been on late night TV, right? Yeah, Can I talk about that a little bit. Late show with Craig Ferguson twice. Um, and the way I got that, I mean, I worked hard, but I opened for him one show. I had seen one show at the Comedy Works. I huh. him in like 2006 at the downtown club. The other club wasn't open then. And uh, it was so funny, the next week, I come into the club, and they're like, Craig Ferguson's people love you. They're going to contact you. And I was like, come on. You know, I'm like, come on. I mean, I didn't think they were kidding, but they're like, no, really. And then I get an email from the talent book, and she goes, hey, we got your contact information from the comedy work. We'd love to have you on the show. Here's what you need to do. And that's where I say I really did the work, because I had to submit a five-minute set. Uh -huh. uh, and then I got notes back from standards and practices, you know. And most of it was brand names, man. They don't want you saying brand names. So... Uh, but there was, I had a joke that was too mean, which was this shovel joke about, I have a, it was when I rap was going, I'd say, this is, it's, it's probably not politically correct, well, it wasn't politically correct then, you know, less so now, but it was like, I had a plan for immigration, I'd take all the illegal immigrants, uh, send them over to Iraq, give each one of them a shovel, tell them anybody who doesn't have a shovel, you know, that was the joke, and they were like, you can't do that, it's too mean, so, but I, what they let me do then was I made the changes in a Word document and said, this joke, this is what I'll do. I'm going to take out that joke, da da da. Got it approved. And then um, I flew out on a Sunday, taped it on a Monday, and it aired that Friday. <laughs> so I, the show that it aired on, I didn't see any of those people, but uh, uh -huh. the show, Travis Tritt was a musical guest on the one where I taped uh -huh. that night. I don't remember the other, but it was great because I did my set, and then they were setting up for Travis Tritt, and I walked by Travis Tritt in the hallway going to the green room. He's like, that was good, brother. I'm like, hey, thanks, man. Nice. So that was cool. And then um, I did it a second time, and it was a different booker, and he came back through, Craig Ferguson did. He is, he's a sweetheart. He's a great guy. Yeah. Because he's like, so, you'd like to have you on the show again? Uh, have you submitted? And I was not having I was having trouble with this new booker, but I wasn't about to go, you know. Right. This person, and he goes, "I'll oh, I'll put in a word for you," and you know it was like this, just okay. Magically and then, opened up. Right. I emailed her, and bam. And what was great about the second time was that they let me submit a transcript, which mm. was so much easier. And I, just like I'm going down here tonight, I recorded on a Tuesday night. I literally sat at my kitchen table at my laptop with headphones on and transcribed that set hmm. and submitted and then because I had done the show once you know I was a little bit smarter about what material to submit yeah uh, and uh, I got a few notes back but an interesting side note on that second set is and this is another joke that's a little bit inappropriate I guess but I had a joke about my ex-wife still lives in Boulder Colorado which is not true but I said uh, my ex still lives in Boulder, and uh, she is so eco-friendly that her vibrator is a hybrid. <laughs> and then Chuck Roy gave me a tag. Chuck Roy is a local comedy. It runs on bitterness and ethanol. So I wanted to submit that joke, 
and this was like 2011 maybe. I don't, is that, would that I, I, I don't know what would happen now if you did that trip, I think. I, but, but I feel I'm, almost like you could do it now. I think you could. Because you can say like swear words yeah, now almost I think you that could. you couldn't they, a long time ago. They let me do it. Like, it was weird. Because, oh, they let you do yeah, it? Yeah, they let me do it. Here's the thing. No way. This, this crazy coincidence. There's a guy named Matt Betts who used to work on that show who moved to Denver. And I'm not even sure what he did, if he wrote or whatever, mm -hmm. but he was on that show. And so I, he, he lived in Denver just for like 18 months. But it was during that time when I was getting ready to submit again. And so I said to him, hey, I've got this joke. I said, can I ask you some questions? He goes, man, you can ask me whatever you want. I'll go over your whole damn set if you want, you know? So I said, um, I have this joke, and it was that hybrid vibrator joke. And he goes, you know what? He goes, that's the kind of joke that you submit and you make them tell you to take it out, you know, and then if they don't, and they didn't. Huh. So then I was talking to another comic about that joke, sort of like I was talking to you, and I go, what do you think? I mean, do you think it's okay for late night? And they were like, you should close on that joke. So then I, I was, took their advice and I closed on that joke. And I, I liked my second set. I mean, I like both of them, but I definitely liked my second set better, you know. And I was getting ready to do it a third time submitted the set and then he announced that he was going to retire and then the booker was like man we'd love to have you but now everything's at a premium you know what I mean like, yeah since he's retiring but still he was he was great man that's amazing yeah have you done much time out in Los Angeles not much I'm, I'm going to do more sets out there it's always it's never been one of my fake places but I sent that to a comic friend of mine. I was like, I don't like LA. And he's like, nobody does. You know, that was a really good. <laughs> but I was out there in February, and I'm going to try to a great to time to go. Yeah. I did uh, an audition for Montreal at the Hollywood Improv Lab. And I did a couple other shows. And now there's so many. I have so many friends in LA from Denver huh. that they can really help me. If I give them some lead time, I can get on, a, you know, I can go out there for like days and get on a bunch of shows, so I'm going to try to do more of that. That's awesome. Maybe run into Pete again. Yeah, you never know. That's the thing that's great, you know, about this. Like, it very rarely works, like A plus B equals this thing. You know what I mean? But, oh, but for Pete Holmes, <coughs> excuse me, then, you know, like you say, you're in L.A., he sees you, hey man, you want to do a set? You know what I mean? It's just right. weird stuff like that. It's a small world. It is a comedy. small world. And also, I have a very unique look, so there could be some guy working on a project who's like, who the hell was that hippie guy in Denver that opened for me? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like stuff like that happens sometimes, you know? Huh. If you could go back, all the way back, uh -huh. uh, and like in a time travel machine and give yourself some advice or some pointers, right. is there anything that you think would make a difference for you? Um, yeah, I think a couple things. You gotta, you gotta do those risks. I mean, don't be crazy. Calculated risks. Take more risks, I think. Because I'm, you know, I'm a crazy looking guy. In the beginning or always? Always. Okay. I, I mean, in the beginning, yeah, you can't do too much. Uh, in the beginning, what I would tell people is what I tell them now. Record and write notes and listen and do all that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I, I do regret, you know, not taking a few more chances that I probably, you know, opportunities that I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. Uh, so that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm a pretty cautious person, really. I mean, I'm a wild-eyed, literally a wild-eyed liberal. I'm really liberal socially, but personally I'm a little more, you know, reserved, I guess. Uh -huh. So I think, yeah, I just have, I, sometimes I have to almost remind myself, go out and do these, you know. That's why I think festivals are good for me, because there's a lot of industry there. Um, and I, you know, I've done three festivals this year, which was great, but I've really got to take a look. I think I'm going to try to go back to Laughing Skull, because I did that in 2016, and they sent an email out saying they want people to come back, because it's changed a little bit. Huh. So I'm going to try to do that. Cool. But yeah, I, I need to be better at, um, you know, taking a little more risks and putting it out there for more people to see. Because as great as this scene is... So you mean, by risk, you don't necessarily mean, like, do a risky joke. You mean, like, get on a stage yeah. that you might, other, you might have stayed at home and just read a right. book. Or try like, harder. Don't be a dick about it, but, you know, try to get 
on these bigger stages without being in, you know, and I'm sure, never going to be, be an pushy, right? Like Rick Kearns told me one time uh, at the South Club, and that's, again, is he's a local guy. He was like, you know, when these big name guys like you, there's nothing wrong with going, hey, if you need a feature. And he goes, I know you, man. You're, you're going to err on the side of being too conservative, which is good, but that's what he was telling me. It's like, right. why not ask? You know, I'm not going to glad hand everybody who comes through that. But there's people that have been like, dude, you were great, you know? And I do need to be a little bit better at that kind of stuff. So I'm, that would be advice that I would give, you know, just in general. Someone starting super new, um, you just have to, I hate to use the word grind it out, but that, yeah. like when a new comic asks me, especially in Denver, I'll tell them there's a website called 5280comedy.com. And I go, look at that. Look at the open mic page. Hit every one of those open mics. If you, if you have the time, or however long it takes you, hit every one of those open mics, figure out which ones are good for you, and go back and do those, you know? And if you do that, and I can tell sometimes, you know, I see people's eyes glassing, glossing over, glassing over, whatever the hell I'm trying to say, you know? And I see other people, you know, I'll see them a year later, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a muscle. It is. You gotta, and it's weak in the beginning. It is, and that's why, like, I still, you know, I'll go, I'll come down here for a five-minute set because I'll think about what it is I want to get out of that five-minute set, you mm -hmm. know? That's awesome. So this, where is this five-minute set headed? Like, are you emailing this off to bookers I'm, and stuff? I'm going to try. I've submitted to a couple of different late-night bookers that are still a little bit interested in me. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a crazy business, yeah. but I, I'll put it this way. I have a couple of people I'm pretty sure that will take a look at that set. And then the other thing is festivals. Yeah. And um, the club, the Comedy Works is great because I can get a copy of pretty much any set that I want. Yeah. And, so, and then I'll just have unlisted YouTube videos. I don't like to put a whole bunch out there. Right. But I have some unlisted videos that I can send to bookers. So when I'm looking at a festival, I have probably four or five different uh, sets that I can submit. So worst case, what I'll, I don't even want to say it that way, what I'll get out of this set, if nothing else, is a good festival submission set and hopefully some more interest in late night. Right. That's awesome. Uh, are there any comics you're particularly enjoying recently, or I guess really any time? Maybe some comedians folks uh, haven't heard of, or um, you mean like Colorado comics, or just any comics? anybody really? But um, um, obviously, you you're around Colorado more. Yeah, I mean, if some local comics, I really enjoy Aaron Urist. I think he's really funny. Um, oh man, there's a comic named Noah Reynolds. Yeah, he's who's the best. great. I who is him. just, I mean, I guess you would consider him new talent. He's pretty pretty young, but man, super funny. Yeah. Allison Rose and Z Carrera, both a couple, I mean, they're actually married, but they're both really funny. And then I mean, like, you know, big name comics. I still really enjoy Do you them. watch comedy? I don't watch no? as much as I want to. I, I, I mean, I shouldn't say that, because I don't watch it, and I have the time. I mean, I have Netflix and stuff, but I'm way behind on right. Netflix specials and stuff, but I want to watch more. And I remember, I, I was, like, really paranoid about watching uh, stand-up specials and stuff and then I read um, uh, Richard Jenny there was a oh, book yeah. called uh, Comic Insights and he they interviewed him and he was talking about comics that don't want to watch other comics perform or other you know right. tapes and stuff and he goes he made the best point that I always remembered he goes if you were a painter are you telling me you wouldn't look at other people's paintings and go how did they do that you right. know and after that so I don't have a problem with that I just get lazy and I'll watch other stupid stuff, you know, yeah. instead of watching uh, stand-up. But you I, got anything great on any genre that you've been enjoying? Netflix or reading uh, or podcasts or? Well, I'll say this: I watch a lot of the late night. I watch like, um, you know, the first couple of segments of late night, like on Seth Meyers and Colbert and stuff. And I gotta say, of of the, <laughs> this guy's. Um, 
I really like Jimmy. He took a risk. He did take a risk. It took him a minute, <laughs> but he did it. Um, I really like Jimmy Kimmel's monologue. I'm not so crazy about the second pieces on some of his shows, but the monologue is great. And I think who's killing it uh, on late night is Seth Meyers with a closer look. And I mean, it's definitely looks a lot like um, Weekend John. Update. Oh, okay. But man, those things are awesome. Yeah. It's really good. So I've really been enjoying that. Um, and right. then I've been doing weird stuff like watching that 70s show, <laughs> that kind of stuff on Netflix. So, I got, can I pull in here, do you think? I think you can for a minute, but watch out for these second. crazy people. Oh, for here? Yeah. All right, I guess you can, sure. All right, let's say hey. goodbye. Bye. John Novoset. Hey, he thanks for the killer. Rugby club. Yeah, yeah, thanks. All right, see you guys. Today's uh, Wednesday, April 15th. Would normally be tax day, but uh, instead we're getting money, I guess. Yeah, I, and I guess we have till July, which I tried to work on my taxes, but I'm just having a hard time focusing on that stuff right now. Yeah. So I'm glad we have some extra time. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, so everything's shut down right now because, uh, you know, the pandemic and whatnot. Uh, do you remember what your last live show was with people? Yeah, I do. Uh, my last live show was March 10th at Comedy Works South, and I headlined that, which is good. And then I actually was supposed to do... Colorado Springs the following weekend, I guess, and I I canceled that, and they were really cool about it. But uh, as a bus rider, and I was going to take a bus and a train, and then mm. get in a car with another comic, and I was like, you know, I'm not exactly a spring chicken. So right. Was, yeah. Was that at Looney's or was yeah. that a? Okay. And Eric was really cool about it. Uh, but yeah, my last show was March 10th, and before that, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Wow. Gildefest, so that was really fun. I flew back on the seventh. And that felt a little bit weird, but it wasn't total craziness yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I was traveling like March 10th or 11th, somewhere in there. And I was scared. Like, you know, I wore a mask on the plane and yeah, was was worried that. for, you know, the 14 days or whatever that I might get sick. But it seems like that's passed. And, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good thing, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. How was the, how was the uh, Comedy Works South show? It was great. Uh, we had which for me was pretty good, probably 150, 175 people. Wow. They were really good. It was a Tuesday night, and it was busy, so that was cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did anybody do shows after you, or were you the last? No, I think they, they still did some shows after that okay. for like um, maybe four or five good days. Were, were they spacing or anything, like intentional spacing? I think they were, yeah. I remember seeing an email or something on their Facebook page about – that they were doing, you know, they'd cut the the capacity down and had six feet in between people and stuff yeah. before they closed. Huh. So it's been about a month, four to five weeks since your last show in person. Have you been doing comedy during this month? And what does that look like? Um, I have, yeah. I've been doing some Zoom shows. I did one last night. I've done like um, probably four of those. And then I've been doing my own show called Afternoon Stream on Facebook, which is, uh, I'm doing it with my friend Eugene Kenny, who's also a comic. And it's really just like, um, it's almost like a weird late night opening. You know, I have some graphics, I make up jokes. I have a, a, uh, a segment called Bad Clip Art. So I show some bad clip art and stuff like that. The, the, the Zoom stand-up shows, it's it's a little bit weird. Cause yeah. You just don't, give it any kind of feedback so yeah i did a go-to um, meeting one same same thing for like a corporate deal and um, it was it was awful <laughs> it was really like i was telling jokes i couldn't hear anything i didn't know if people were enjoying it it was uh it was it was yeah. tough i said all those years of doing sports bars in the midwest for three people got me ready for zoom shows nice you know? nice now, are, are there Zoom shows? Are they, like, all over the country or, or where? Um, yeah, the ones that I've done are basically, you know, in the Colorado area. I'm trying to think if I've done. I don't know. I don't think I've done any that were other, other okay. parts of the country. But I've got a couple that are coming up, hopefully, that will be. But I see, yeah, I see them all over the country. Yeah. Uh, so you're in Boulder now, right? Boulder, Colorado? Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, you've traveled a lot doing comedy. Uh, who knows how long we're going to be stuck where we are. 
is Boulder a good place to be? Are, are you happy where you are? Is there a place in the world that would be ideal to be for this pandemic? No, I'm happy where, where I'm at, you know, because I'm from here. I still have some relatives here that I stay in touch with. Okay. So if I was on the road and just quarantine, I mean, I would make do with whatever situation I was in, but I'm happy to be home for sure. Nice. And I nice. like it here. I, my landlord's cool, so. Oh, know. cool. It's good. You're good on groceries and all the staples, stuff like that? Yeah, I've got, I'm actually trying to get an order delivered just to see what that's like, but they keep delaying it. So, but I still have plenty of staples and if I have to, I can, there's a safe way not too far. But, yeah. You know. I, I've been doing the, uh, like you order online, but you go pick it up and they just stick it in your trunk. And, yeah. uh, and I, I keep tipping the people because I think they're like the heroes. Like I feel so bad for them. They're work, you know, they're, I'm scared to go outside and, you know, they're making not a lot of money and really putting themselves at risk. So, yeah, uh, I tip them too, man. And I'm like, you know, and luckily I'm in a position, I certainly am not rich, but I'm in a position financially where I've got a little money saved. And yeah. Someone's willing to do that. I'm yeah. gonna tip them. I just leave a little cash in a plastic bag in the trunk, and uh, yeah. so, sometimes they say, "Oh, we can't accept tips," and I start yelling at them through my mask. No, take it. You <laughs> take yeah. it. Take it. Take it. <laughs> yeah, they should definitely take it. Yeah. Um. So here's here's a like kind of a gambling question. A, a choose choose a date. Uh, when do you think things will go back to normal? Um, and, and in two parts, because I think when things go back to normal, like everybody going back to work, et cetera, may be different than for comedians. Because like in China, the movie theaters are still closed, but other things are open. So two parts. When will things go back to normal? Just pick a date at random. And then when do you think comedy works? Let's say downtown will have its next show. I mean, that's such a hard uh, question, you know, to answer, but... And I guess it depends on what you consider normal. I think that uh, I would say by the end of May, there'll be some businesses open again. Okay. Uh, and, you know, there'll be a very limited amount. As far as like when clubs, comedy clubs open again, man, I mean, I'm going to say September. Okay. Who knows? It yeah. could be even longer than that. Yeah. And it, it, it might be a new normal where, like you were talking about earlier, you know, they have people spaced six, ten feet apart. The clubs, instead of 300, are maybe 125. Yeah. I think, but it could be a long time before it's back to normal, normal. Yeah. You know, like that, over a year. That could be funny at Comedy Works where they have a two-drink minimum, but if they space it out six people, it's like a 12-drink minimum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Everybody gets drunk, for sure. Yeah. Um, you've been doing comedy since 1980. I just watched our conversation, by the way. It was incredible. Uh, it was really fun reviewing that. Thanks again for doing it. Um, so I, I have a question for you about um, doing comedy after tragedies. And so you were doing comedy at 9-11, which is the last tragedy I can remember or, or kind of mm -hmm. changed the nation. Do you remember anything uh, about doing comedy after then? Which is ob obviously different. Yeah, um, well, I, I made the choice not to do jokes about it, but um, the one thing I really remember is when David Letterman came back okay. after 9-11 and watched that. That was just incredible, and I think you can still find that on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I was pretty gentle in my approach when I came back because I didn't feel like really bringing that up. That was my own personal choice. Yeah. Are you on your Zoom shows? Are you doing old material? Or are you doing topical stuff about the pandemic? And are you... um, I'm doing a little bit, you know, like I've been social distancing for years before that, those kind of jokes. Yeah. Um, you know, washing my hands so much that uh, I wash the hair off the palms, that, that kind of <laughs> those kind of jokes but not too much you know with a couple of nice cool um so during our conversation you mentioned uh you, you didn't want to brag but you had some casino gigs coming up in new mexico in april uh can we get an update on what's going on with those i assume they're not yeah, happening they, they were canceled in fact all my work through pretty much the middle of june uh is canceled but yeah they they were canceled which i was grateful you know because again 
I mean, I love doing stand up, but I also feel like <laughs> taking a big risk, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, and I, I'm not rescheduled with those right now, but uh, they, they canceled on me, which was fine. And so, you know, I'll get them another time. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, one of the things you talked about during our conversation was about taking risks in comedy and, and maybe trying for bigger stages, etc. And we talked, you know, last year, uh, maybe before the pandemic or even during the pandemic. Have you been doing anything to um, try and get yourself onto a bigger stage or into a bigger place? I mean, physically or like contacting clubs and stuff, I haven't just because I figure, you know, it's going to be just crazy um, when this all starts up again. So I probably should be doing that. But one of the things I thought about is once I feel like I can travel safely and that this is back to normal, I'm definitely going to spend more time in some of the bigger markets like Los Angeles, New York, and try to make some stuff happen that way. But I'm not actively pursuing that right now. I just, sure. I feel like I'm going, you know, making it day to day, hour to hour right now. Yeah. But I definitely, once I feel that, and even if things go back, you know, I'm still going to judge how I feel about traveling and all that stuff. You know what I mean? I've got to factor in that myself. But, yeah, I definitely want to go to, to some of the bigger markets once this is uh, more normal. What, what would you say the top five big markets are that you would target? I mean, definitely Los Angeles, New York. Um, and after that, it gets, you know... Kind of, it's kind of a choose your own adventure. Chicago is a big market. Okay. Uh, San Francisco could be. Oh yeah. You know. Sure. Uh, something like that. Okay, maybe Austin or Minneapolis. Yeah, Austin would be a good place. That's the other thing is to look at some of those clubs. So Austin has a really good club. Yeah. So it'd be fun to try to get in there. Nice, awesome. Um, so this is the very end. You're the finale. This is the end of this like 21 episode arc wow. on uh, season one. We're basically. The, the idea was to generate content for comedians that are new, first couple years into comedy, kind of learn from some more experienced comedians. You're by far the most experienced comedian that I was privileged to talk to. Uh, do you have any kind of parting words of advice for comics who are one, two years in? Um, sure. You know, one is obviously everything has changed right now. So you have to be patient, and it's I I have a, I, I'm grateful for doing this afternoon stream thing because it gives me something to work on and something to write. But if I just sit down and try to write jokes now, it's really hard. So you know I would say try to weather the storm uh, and write when you can. And when you do get back to recording, it's the same advice. Or when you do get back to doing shows, it's the same advice that I give to new comics: record things, either audio or video review tape, make changes, rate your jokes, all of that kind of stuff. And, and you know, I say this to myself as I say it to everybody else, write, even when it's hard, try to write, you know. And it is hard to focus right now. I mean, it, it is hard, but you just have to do it. So I guess that's my advice. That's awesome. Cool. So if somebody's looking at watching this video a year from now and everything, we're going gangbusters, how can they track you down, find your live shows? Uh, um, what's a good way yeah. to hippie man.com is uh, my website and then I think there's links to there are there's links to my social media and I, I post a lot of stuff on Facebook as far as shows and stuff so okay it's best to find me there are you are you on Facebook are you there under John Novosad yeah I okay. was under hippie man and Facebook made me change <laughs> and how do you <laughs> spell hippie is it IE or Y yeah, I E H I P P I E. Okay. Is that the official correct spelling of hippie? I don't I, it know. is for me. Okay, right on. I don't know. Cool. And and then during the pandemic, if anybody's watching this, April twenty twenty, uh, they can find your Facebook streams and. Yeah, I, I'll I'll make an event uh, for a live stream. It's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Okay. Right now at three p.m. Mountain daylight time and they usually run anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes and it's just silly crazy stuff but it's really fun and i'm having a blast like i say working with my friend eugene kenny on it so it's been good it's nice. really has given me something to do which is cool that's awesome all right well thanks a lot for your time john really appreciate sure. it stay safe and well and you uh, too mark thanks we'll so catch much catch you on the other side all right take care